All right, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm a big procrastinator, so last night I was frantically working on this talk in the speaker lounge while all of you guys were partying, and to calm my nerves, I had a glass of wine with me. And I think we can all guess what happened. I killed my laptop with the wine. <laughs> but luckily, uh, I was working with my partner, Eric, who uh, he, both because uh, it was practical and also because he leaves less of a chance than I do, everything was backed up on Dropbox. So the presentation is here, otherwise it would just be 45 minutes of me sobbing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Um, the lesson is please back up, back up your data um, or things will get really bad. Um, but as he said, I'm Lauren. Um, I wrote my MFA uh, thesis on food foraging, and while I did that, I got really into knowing about especially the plants and fungus around me, um, because it, I, I like to know what I can eat. <laughs> um, so I got into looking at uh, projects that a lot of people contributed data to, uh, which is citizen science, which is also known as crowd science, crowdsource science, civic science, network science, or public participation in scientific research. Uh, and here's a nice concise definition of it from uh, openscientist.org. The systematic collection and analysis of data, development of technology, testing of natural, natural phenomena, and the dissemination of these activities by researchers on a primarily avocational basis. And so I like this because it is a nice short definition, but it doesn't really capture all of the nuances about what citizen science is. So I found this much longer definition um, about uh, citizen science from Societies, uh with consortium of 2013, which is from Europe. Uh, and this is the general public engagement in scientific research activities, when citizens actively contribute to science, either with intellectual effort or surrounding knowledge or with their tools and resources. Participants provide experimental data and facilities for researchers, raise new questions, and co-create a new scientific culture. While adding value, volunteers acquire new learning and skills and deeper understanding of the scientific work in an appealing way. As a result of this open, networked, and transdisciplinary scenario, science society policy interactions are improved, leading to a more democratic research based on research, dem more democratic research based on evidence informed decision making, as is scientific research conducted in whole or part by amateur or non professional scientists. Long, a little bit dense, but things I like about it is it talks about how citizen science can be active or passive. You can both actively contribute data or knowledge, or it can be more of a resource uh, or facility donation, which would be a more of a passive way of doing it. Um, an example of donating, of uh, contributing data might be bird watching, where you go out with a bunch of people and you count the different species of birds that you do. Um, some resources you might contribute would be distributed networking, hosting, or a more active form of contributing resources might be web design. Um, and really, uh, one of the biggest contributions that I think the open source community can contribute is something like web hosting or the general preservation of the data that is created. Because people can die, uh, projects can lose funding, a number of terrible things can happen, but if you are a steward of the data, you can make sure that it is there. And also, you can act a bit, a little bit as sort of the anti-gatekeeper, because you can let people into data that might otherwise be secreted away. So here's a little bit about the history of citizen science. One of the first projects was SETI at Home. Um, this was started in 1999 uh, by the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, it was more of a passive form of citizen science, um, wherein people would allow their computers to be used 
to uh, analyze data from radio telescopes because we were getting a lot of information. Uh, this project is called SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, trying to answer the question, are we alone? So assuming that most of the radio signals that we would be getting would have to be intelligently made, that's the place to look for potential messages or evidence of existence of other life. And so they were getting just lots of noise and information coming in, and they were like, we don't have the resources to do this. So they reached out to the general community. And can I get a show of hands? How many people use SETI at home? Yeah, yeah, I did for a while. Um, how many still do it? It is. So here is one of the problems with SETI at home, is that our technology changed. Back when we were all using desktops, you left your desktop on, you let SETI at home run, and then you had all that time that you weren't using your computer to donate. But now we're all on laptops for the most part. We don't leave them on, we close them down, or they hibernate or something, and we don't have that extra computing time because we're trying to save energy. So SETI at home has a lot, has a lot fewer users now, I think. So here's a really cool one. This was started in 2007. It's called Galaxy Zoo. And this is actually, the photograph is a poster of all the volunteers at one point that were working on Galaxy Zoo. Um, and what Galaxy Zoo is, is uh, there's a whole lot of information coming in about new galaxies. And they need to classify them based on what the shape is. Is it? An elliptical galaxy? Is it a merging galaxy? Is it a spiral? If it's a spiral, how many arms does it have? And they don't have enough scientists there to just go through galaxy by galaxy and decide what it is. So what they do is they allow the public to look at this very new data. You might be the first person to ever see this galaxy and decide what you think it is. And then there's a consensus on what the shape is. And um, SETI at home, it was, all you had to do was download it and start it going. This one has a little bit more of an entry because you have to do a tutorial, but it's not very difficult. This is another one I tried and absolutely hated. Uh, this is by the University of Washington. Um, and it's based on uh, the assumption that Human protein folders can be more effective than computers at certain aspects of protein structure prediction. So to try to figure out how proteins are folded, yes, they could do it on computers, but they're thinking that humans might have some reasoning and intuition um, that are better than computers. So what they do is first you have to go through a giant battery of tutorials learning how proteins fold. And then you try to get it as compact as possible. And this is a gamification of this information. And so the top scores get reviewed. And they're like, well, perhaps this is the way that these proteins work. And this is very valuable, especially in medicine. Um, proteins have a lot to do, well, proteins have all to do with basic human body functioning. And when they get screwed up, we have diseases. And so learning how these screwed up proteins are folding and how the regular ones are folding are very important to learn how to target drugs and other things to uh, fix these diseases. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. I tried to do it and I gave up after the first two games. Um, my spatial reasoning just isn't that great. Um, for other people who are really good at that, it might be exciting. But this, in general, citizen science, I think, has to have a low barrier to entry. And this one is pretty high. So this one <laughs> is one of my favorite. Uh, this is iNaturalist's roadkill app. Um, <laughs> so uh, iNaturalist uh, is done by adventurers and, adventurers and scientists for conservation in the Road Ecology Center Wildlife Observation Network. And it's all of a joint project with all these people. It was preceded by a different uh, roadkill app called Roadkill Garnu from the Imperial College of London. I, that, one, that one, I think, stopped taking in data in 2012. This one is going now. Um, the interface looks a lot better. Um, it was aimed at cyclists because, 
because they move slow enough and it can be dangerous to get out of your car and yeah. you probably don't see it and if you do see it it might be dangerous to like block traffic and get out of the car to photograph roadkill um, I haven't used it yet because if I used it I mostly just bike in the city it would be squirrel 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 possum possibly no. yeah and so this is an example of one of the entries um, it tracks where you picked it up, or you didn't pick it up, you didn't touch it, you didn't touch it at all. <laughs> it shows you where you photographed it. Um, you don't have to know what kind of animal it is. It's nice if you do, but you can just make a guess. Um, and there's a place where you can enter how sure you are of that guess. I'm guessing that's a skunk. Well, it's a skunk, yeah. but yeah. maybe you don't know what species of skunk it is. Yeah. Um, but they say that just a general thing like this is a skunk is useful. Um, it gets the date, it gets what kind of road you were on. In this case, it was a state slash rural highway, the speed limit. Um, and what they're trying to do with I, this app is figure out what kind of road kill, like what species get killed, how they get killed, what areas they get killed in. Um, and try to identify hotspot problems and places where they need to do something about the roads to save certain populations. Um, and also just an idea of where these animals live and where they're, go where they're moving to, what their migration is. Um, because you can get an, somewhat of a sample of what a population is by how much of it dies. Um, so. This is a small little overview of some citizen science projects. There are a lot more. You can see them. There are ones that analyze asteroids. There are ones that look at cancer. There are ones that try to solve various math problems. Um, really anything you might be interested in, you can probably find a project that you can participate with. And so the title of my talk comes from a book called Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora. And this is the Mushroom Bible. Mushrooms of the Mystified is one of the best uh, reference and identification books that there is out there. Um, so there's an issue with mushrooms in that there's less than 5% of fungi that exist out there in the world that we think there are. And we only think we know about 5% of them. Um, we're discovering new species of fungi every year very rapidly, about 280 a year. Um, and at that rate, it can take about 5,000 years to, to determine what all these fungi are. Um, and the taxonomy of fungi is a total mess, just a disaster. Um, Mushroom Observer was created by a man named Nathan Wilson. Um, I, when I, this year I went to, uh, the Brighton Bush Mushroom Gathering in October, which if you, haven't, if you haven't heard of it, I would look it up. It's really fun. You uh, spend three days soaking in natural hot springs, and in the mornings and the afternoons, you go out and you look for mushrooms. Um, and you have professional mycologists there to help you figure out what you found and whether you can eat it or not. Um, so, um, there is, uh, one of the mycologists while I was there said that they thought that mycology, which is the study of mushrooms, was about 100 years behind botany, to give you an idea of how it's doing as a science. Um, and there's, they're very strange, because we, have, we just don't know that much about them. Um, trying to get down to my notes. What do I do? Oh, okay. Nope. Oh. <laughs> it's working. Do I have to get down? To, okay, there it's we go. The oh, okay. So um, I'm going to read a quote to you from uh, a book called The Mushroom Hunters by Langdon Cook. And Langdon Cook was uh, a man I met at the Brighton Bush Mushroom Gathering. He also wrote a book about foraging. Um, and then he wrote a book this, that came out this year about the professional mushroom hunters, primarily in the Pacific Northwest. And so this is what he has to say about a morel. Their taxonomy is a mess. 
Little is known about when, where, and why they will fruit. And even their purpose is not well understood. Are morels saprophytic or mycorrhizal? And then saprophytic means uh, it, lives, it eats dead wood, and mycorrhizal means it lives symbiotically with uh, usually tree roots. Um, or both at different states of their life cycle. Technically speaking, morels are not even mushrooms. As, a member, as members of the Ascomycota phylum, they're actually cup fungi, differentiating them from true mushrooms, which are members of the Basiomycota phylum. So actually, this is a picture of the first morel I've ever found, and the only morel I've ever found. I found it this spring on Sovi Island. Um, it, was, it was tasty, um, but this was unfortunately a rule. I know, that's the one thing we know about those. They're very, very good. Um, they, uh, they, we had, they unfortunately had a bad year, and so uh, if you didn't find one this year, don't feel bad. So here comes Mushroom Observer to do something about the fact that we know very little about mushrooms. Um, I should note that Nathan Wilson is also the technical lead for the Encyclopedia of Life. And the Encyclopedia of Life is an aggregate of data from a number of different uh, research projects. And it's trying to provide um, a place where you can get data about any living thing that exists. It's a pretty big undertaking. <laughs> um, so Mushroom Observer was created in 2006. Um, and it's a shared database uh, where people can uh, log photos of the mushrooms that they find, the locations of where the mushrooms they found uh, were, uh, occurrences being like what time of year they found them, um, how often they find them, and such like that, and descriptions, and uh, it puts a place to have discussion. Oh, one thing I didn't know about the Roadkill app when I showed you the screen is down below there, there were comments. Um, and I expected the comments to be like, oh, technical things about exactly what species the skunk are. They were all like condolences and like RIPs for the skunk. It was really cute. Um, and so all the photos on Mushroom Observer are licensed under one of the Creative Commons licenses. Um, and the code is an MIT license. So you can use that if you like. Uh, and one of the most common uses that um, people do with Mushroom Observer when they are doing research or writing something about mushrooms is they use it mostly for the photos that are under the Creative Commons license. I don't know if any of you read the Slate article about the death caps, but the, some of the photos from there came from uh, Mushroom Observer. Um, I've seen field guides with photos from Mushroom Observer. and. Uh, I want to introduce you to this man. This is a mycologist named Noah Siegel. I also met him at the Brighton Bush Mushroom Gathering. And the mushroom he is holding uh, is this really cool purple cortinarius. It's very, very purple and a little bit fuzzy. So it's a little bit like velvet. Um, I think it is the cortinarius uh, violaceus. Um, so Noah uses Mushroom Observer as a professional mycologist. Uh, to look at the mushroom ranges. So he, he's a very knowledgeable person. But he might want to see what are the limits of this mushroom that I couldn't personally know myself. And maybe maybe guidebook says it's here to here, but maybe it's not. Maybe I can go on to Mushroom Observer and see that it goes much farther north or west than we think it does. Um, and for the fruiting times, maybe it's more broad or narrow than he thinks it is. And so when he's writing a guide or an article or something, he checks this to see what are the extremes of these mushrooms? Um, their mushrooms also don't always look the same. They can be really strange. Um, actually, I think they can go back. There we go. This guy is an Amanita muscaria. Um, it is the, uh, the uh, Mario mushroom, the one that <laughs> it's one of the most famous mushrooms uh, in the world, uh, just because it looks so neat, I think. Um, it'll also, it's also toxic. A lot of people think it's fatal. Generally not fatal. It will make you trip and wish you never, ever, ever had touched it. Um, it it's, it'll make you very, very sick. Um, but this one uh, is traditionally red, but you can see it in beige and yellow, sort of an orangey color. 
Um, and if you didn't know that they weren't all red, you might not know what it is. Um, so you can also build a species list. Uh, and a lot of mycologists use this sort of as a, uh, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what they do it. I would use it for bragging rights if for anything. It's sort of like, it's sort of like your, yeah, it's like a catalog of everything you found, where you found it, when you found it, um, and you can use it a little bit as a mushroom finding resume. Um, Noah has a herbarium. I don't know why it's called an herbarium, even if it's mushrooms, but it's dried samples of mushrooms. He, when he gets his mushrooms, he puts them in a dehydrator, and then he takes them home. Um, and so he publishes her, his herbarium on Mushroom Observer. So if there's another mycologist that one need, wants to study one of his mushrooms, they can see what he has available for them to look at. Um, he also uses it to add to his collection. If he's on Mushroom Observer, and he sees that there's someone out there that has found a mushroom that he has never seen, and that he's in the region or can get to them, he'll be like, hey, I see you found this mushroom, and you saw it recently. Can you take me to this place that you found it so I can add it to my herbarium? And also, he gets bored. And sometimes during the year, there just aren't that many mushrooms, especially in the winter. And so when he's getting mushroom withdrawal, he'll go on there, <laughs> and he will go and ID the mushrooms. Um, they have users from all over the world. Somebody was asking me if they have users in Australia. Yes, indeed, they do. And so when it's the Northern Hemisphere is having its winter, you can look at what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. One interesting thing about Noah, um, he lives a myco-hobo lifestyle, where he follows the mushrooms around. There are a lot of different people who rely on the mushrooms for their living. And most people of that type are mushroom hunters who are selling the mushrooms commercially. But Noah is a, just studying them. And so he, he is a professionally a mycologist. So he also has to follow them. He doesn't work out of a university or something like that. Um, so something like knowing where things are fruiting for him is extremely important. Um, he also doesn't like to eat mushrooms. Yeah? Um, does he get paid by anyone to do this? Or? You know, he's a very mysterious character. <laughs> And what I'm about to tell you is going to make it even weirder. He's so interesting. I don't even know if he has any formal like, education. He's just brilliant. And he studied mushrooms all his life. Just He discovered very early in his life that mushrooms, that's my thing. He doesn't like to eat them. He thinks they taste, not so much the taste, but he thinks they have a weird texture. Um, and he feels really ambivalent about people who do like to eat them. Because at one point, it's bringing about some eyes on these mushrooms that he might not be able to see. He studied, one of the things that he studies are beliefs. Lots of beliefs are very tasty. But if you are eating the beliefs, he doesn't have them in his uh, specimens. Uh, so he feels mixed about that. When he goes looking for mushrooms, he often only goes a few feet. A lot of us go out busting into the woods, tearing around, looking at all the really big mushrooms. And he just sort of looks, looks around for all the tiny little guys and picks them all up. Very interesting person. So this is what the interface of Mushroom Observer looks like. It is unfortunately not as user friendly as it could be. However, they are hoping to improve it soon. Um, so if you want to create an observation, you go to the left, you go to create an observation. And what the information that it needs is the uh, date of when you took the photograph of the mushroom. A lot of times I won't actually get around to it until much later because I am a procrastinator. Um, so uh, I always check the, the data that my photo has to see when it is. Um, and then the where. Uh, this actually didn't go through. I, had to, I took the screenshot before I submitted it. Um, it actually knew where OMSI was. It did not know um, that this whole thing was in the USA. So I had to put the country down. Um, if you know the GPS location, that's awesome. Um, it will, I wanted to point out that it will autofill uh, if you start typing in the uh, genus and species, it'll autofill it for you. Um, it has to be by scientific name, it doesn't go by common name. There are a lot of good reasons for that. Um, one of the mushrooms, the very first mushroom I showed you was a Dryad Saddle, the one that sort of was brown and looked a little feather feathery. Some people might also call it a hawkswing sometimes. Hawkswing is also another different mushroom, and so you don't want to use common names 
when you are identifying things for official purposes because uh, sometimes they have more than one name attached to them. Or two different mushrooms will share a name. Um, and then one neat feature is that it says, how certain are you about the confidence of this mushroom identification? You don't have to know what it is. You can, if you want, put nothing in the what, just put unknown. You can if you want. I at least usually try to put a genus in there to guess. Um, and then I'll mark the confidence something is not so good. This was for a, um, a shaggy mane mushroom, and I was sure of what it was. Um, for those of one, you guys who are curious about what a shaggy mane mushroom is, it's um, sort of a, kind of a umbrella shaped, but a long, deep umbrella. It's not very parasol shaped. It's sort of a like a, maybe like a head of like cousin it or something like that. <laughs> and it's white. Um, and I knew what it was, and I felt certain, so I said I'd call it that. Um, I recognized by sight. If you use a reference, you would check to use a reference, and you would say which reference you used. Often, the one I use is mushrooms demystified. Um, chemical features has to do with, uh, there are a series of different chemicals. Often, it's iron salts um, or uh, ammonia, is it? It's ammonia, yeah to test and see what the identity of a certain mushroom is. Um, and then you say whether the mushroom you found is on the location that you found it on, or sometimes you'll be at a mushroom show and you'll take a picture and be like, no, that's not where they found it. I don't know where. Um, I never have an herbarium. I don't save the mushroom, so I don't <laughs> log that part. And then you have some notes down below that you fill in. Um, I just said that it was growing uh, near OMSI, and it was probably in old wood chips or what had been old mulch. Um, and then down below that, you would uh, upload your photograph. So this is for this this is for a very strange mushroom that I found <clears throat> in Maryland. Uh, I grew up in Maryland, and I don't know much about the mushrooms out there because I became interested in mushrooms when I moved out to the Northwest. Um, so I had no idea what this was. Um, my guess, my best guess that it was a kind of mushroom called an earth star. So that's what I did. I said it was, a, I said it was that. Um, and originally, my uh, vote was could be. Um, I thought it could be an earth star. And then very shortly after, this user called Shua got on, and he was like, <clears throat> no, I think it's this calistoma here. Um, and so then I changed my vote because I saw the images of the other calistomas, which are uh, stalked puffballs. And I was like, of course, yes, that's what it looks like. I, I don't have experience with that. I wouldn't have known that. And then I changed my vote. If I wanted to, to um, save my pride or something, I could delete that. But I think it's useful to see the history of how people are judging things and making mistakes. And so then I changed it. And this is all by, um, it gets, ended up, ends up getting listed by consensus. So you weigh your vote based on how certain you are that you know what it is. And in this case, I was not certain. And then I made myself even less certain. So you can use Mushroom, ident uh, mushroom Observer to identify mushrooms, keep track of the mushrooms that you have found. And if you, who goes mushroom hunting out here? I don't mean out here is in like the Northwest, but yeah. Yeah, I, I really like mushroom hunting, and um, sometimes you don't know what's out there right now. Um, and you don't know when it's fruiting, or you might, it's best if you have an inkling of what's happening. And I had heard people talking about the fact that the prince mushroom had been fruiting. And the prince mushroom is this very delicious mushroom that's part of the agaricus group. And agaricus uh, are mushrooms like the ones you get in the grocery store, which I will let you in on a little secret that will probably blow your minds. So you know Cremini's? You know Portobello's? Same mushroom. Same mushroom, different parts of their lifestyle. It's different parts of their life cycle. <laughs> life cycle. Um, so uh, the prince mushroom is also an agaricus. It's a different species of agaricus. Um, and so to find out whether or not it's fruiting around you, what you would do is you would use the scientific name in the search, which is agaricus augustus. Which is interesting. It's called the Prince Mushroom, but I think of Augustus as being more of like a Caesar or something like that. So it's sort of a Caesar mushroom. Um, and you want to look under observations. There are a number of other searches you can do, um, such as user, name, things like that. 
But when you log a mushroom finding, it's called an observation. Um, you want to search by date once you get the observations, and that'll show you the most recent uh, sightings of that mushroom. Um, what I would like to see is to be able to like use two factors and do it by date and by area. Um, I think they're working on that. Um, but here you can see that the last one that someone saw was June 22nd in Seattle. That's kind of good news and bad news. It means it is in the Northwest right now, but you might have missed the season because if they're finding it in Seattle, it might be too warm here. But you know, try going up the in altitude a little bit, and you might find it. It's I didn't I didn't take a picture of all of these, but there I'm, there have been sightings in Oregon, of course. People find them all the time in Portland. Well, not all the time during their fruiting season. Um, but you might be able to find one in this list that's more recent from Portland. So. Um, if you would like more information about uh, citizen science and Mushroom Observer, uh, I invite you to check out Mushroom Observer yourself. Um, they are asking for people to help out. <clears throat> um, they need to do a lot of refactoring of their code. Um, they also need to do, do something about HTML safe. I'm not a coder. I don't know exactly what that means. Um, but they need help with testing that. Um, and they said to, yes? Rails. It's in Rails. Yeah, it's a Rails app. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. It's a, it's a Rails app. They're looking for help. But a lot of other different places are looking for help. Um, I also wanted to have you guys check out, if you want to, the Encyclopedia of Life, eol.org. A lot of Mushroom Observer's data goes put into uh, the Encyclopedia of Life. Um, Zooniverse is the group that does Galaxy Zoo. Um, they have a lot of different other projects. It's really cool. I encourage you guys to go look at Zooniverse and see what sort of side of science you'd be interested in. I'm sure there's something there. Um, and then this is a very interesting article about how important it is to be a steward of data um, for, for bioinformatics. Um, they're, they're looking at what the data infrastructure that's available and what's still there. So if you need some sort of conviction that you need to be involved in citizen science and help with uh, the data infrastructure that will that'll convince you. Um, so I want to thank you very much. Uh, I am Larden Hudgens. And if you want to contact me, there's my Twitter handle. Um, I had used Instagram. Um, and I do post a lot of photographs of mushrooms and some other food foraging things that I do. Um, it's unfortunately mostly cats, or fortunately, depending on how you feel about that. Um, but you can find the information there. Um, I also write on the PDXX Collective, which is a feminist writing group. Um, and mostly I talk less about feminism and more about what I'm eating that's out there in the dirt. Um, Nick, I wanted to invite you to say something about the Lichen project you're working on. All right. Yeah, cool. I didn't have a chance to put it into my presentation yeah. yesterday. So you go outside, outside to any of these street trees you'll see lichen covering them. All different species of lichen. You could spend a lot of time at one street tree identifying lichens. Um, and they are also a fungus, but a relationship between a mycobiont, which is a fungus, and a photobiont, which is uh, an alga and or cyanobacterium. One thing that's interesting, though, about like finding them, collecting them, building a lichen herbarium is that they uh, preserve very well. Like you, they're already very dry. Yeah. <laughs> they keep their form. They generally keep most of their color for a while. So you can collect them and then actually have specimens in a few months later be like, okay, I'm finally going to identify those or have someone help you. Whereas with uh, the fruiting body of a mushroom or other fleshy fungus, it's much harder to do it down the line. Plus, you can work on them all winter long because they're just everywhere. So anyway, the, I'm a member of the New York Mycological Society. I live in Brooklyn. And ev almost every week, we have official or unofficial walks around New York. And recently, we've been getting more into identifying lichens. And we, I put on a workshop recently. I, I started up a GitHub project, uh, NYC Lichen Checklist, uh, to just make a checklist of the New York City lichens. I, and we're both building this based on herbarium specimens at the 
let's see, New York Botanical Garden and Rutgers University, as well as some other checklists that are out there and our own observations. I may, I, I'm not sure where it's gonna go eventually, but it's just one sort of like community organized uh, identification and checklist project of species in a specific area. Cool, yeah. Um, I would, one thing I would like to see for these project is, uh, projects are more apps because there's a lot of uh, ability when you can just go out with your GPS location already there, take a photograph it and have it logged onto the site from there. Um, so that's something I would really like to see with Mushroom Observer maybe for your Lycan app, although it does sound like it's better to have it in a herbarium and a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to contribute all of this information to Mushroom Observer. Yeah. I, I, I've really enjoyed your talk and I, I want to get involved cool. with it now. I, and I mean, this would line up perfectly for that, whether it's organized in another place and just like shared with Mushroom Observer. There are Lycans on there, yeah. Yeah, I, and, and I saw there, that there are Lycans, and that could also help with identification opening it up more to people outside of the New York area. Cool. Yeah. Eric? Encyclopedia of Life is also interesting there in that it's uh, aggregating data from other repositories. Which, because as we're collecting more data, it's, it's um, from different uh, di different uh, specialties. Uh, it becomes interesting to correlate and you know make um, all these different no. data sources Yeah. Like yeah, and Nathan Wilson called it a one-stop shop for all of this information. So uh, I, um, I, I know you mentioned um, the sort of a mush fungal hobo. Mike hobo, yeah. Hobo. Um, and it seems like mushrooms kind of have this rebel thing where there are. It seems like there's a lot more of the people who are really deeply involved in it are not affiliated with the university. Yeah. And gathering part of it and the sort of secrecy associated with it and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you could comment on the, maybe the connection between that and the fact that mushroom culture is so successful and yes. centralized. Okay, so uh, let me see which part to tackle first. Okay, so part of it is that the science is way behind the other sciences and so it's not as established, there aren't as many people involved and um, Another, the secrecy part, one interesting about Mushroom Observer is that you can give it a general area, so you don't have to tell it exactly where you found your mushrooms. Because nobody likes to do that when they get a good, find a good cache of mushrooms. They're, they're not going to tell you, probably. Um, depends on what it was. Last year, I don't know if you guys did mushroom hunting in the fall, but the chantelles were crazy, and it didn't matter. Um, <laughs> it didn't matter if you told people, they would be there. Um, and, uh, but you can give a general area, like I was on this side of the mountain or something like that. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, I, I'm happy to answer questions about citizen science. Um, also, just about mushrooms, if you want to talk about mushroom hunting. I really like talking about that. Um, so I want to open it up for questions. Is it unique, like, you the were, were great last year. Yeah, they were wonderful. So, so Well, that's one thing that Mushroom Observers is, should be there to, to do, is to look and see what people are finding every year. A lot of these mushrooms, we just don't know how they behave, especially morels. Chanterelles we know a little bit more about, but we're not always sure how to predict what it's going to be like. Um, I remember I was at the, uh, uh, the food co-op, farmer's market, and there was just a sign of the person selling morels, just like, it was a terrible year. Why? Nobody knows. Uh, <laughs> But this mushroom observer should help with that. Yeah. Oh. Five minutes. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, if yes. I just have a thought here because I also work in open science. Is that maybe you should be also careful with such projects because sometimes it's very different between participating and crowdsourcing. So yes. Yes. But then, thank you, you have a paper now, but the data, like, you know. Yeah. So uh, I, I really like this part, which is where everything you're contributing. 
everybody gets back. Yes, so you yes. Build upon that and then see like where you see the entire zone. But like for example, the folded, you look, you didn't really get the same yeah. anything back. Like they got a lot of knowledge and, and good footage, but. Yeah, that's a really that's you, you had, that's a really good point. You had a big, like, big press, that's that's a really good point. This is a lot of give and take. Where something like SETI or Folded or something like that, it is and and even the Roadkill app. Although the Roadkill app, the data is more public too. But it was definitely done with uh, the inclination that these people who already had these studies set up would pull out the data. Um, but you can still see it. Um, that's a really good point. Hey, they could. They could totally do it. They could totally do that, and that would be terrible. What if you were the one who found the aliens, or your computer was? It's passive. I mean, it's just a special computer, and you'll never know. Yes? Tomorrow at the unconference, mm -hmm. if you wanted to do a forging session, I know I would attend it, and I bet there are other people here who would as well. OK, I would have to figure out. Um, I'd have to scatter out what's around here. Um, but I would be happy to do that. Um, downtown is not the best place, but we can figure something out. Do you know a place? You have to head up into the West Hills. Yeah, OK. We're pretty close yeah. to the West Hills. Sure, I would be happy to take people into the West Hills if people wanted to go to the West Hills. I thought it just ran through the West Hills. So yeah. 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 I should point out that since SETI at home is a closed source project, my network professor friend likes to call it Avon at home. Because, hey, who knows what you're actually doing? Yeah. <laughs> That's true. You might be analyzing data for weapons that kill people. It's true. Yeah, Eric. So I really, I think that's a really good point. Like yeah. That, um, that uh, it, it seems like the most successful. Like, sure, you can get people involved in like classification or whatever, but it's not a sustaining community. Like, if you take the data away, I mean, it's it's a it's it's a flow. Of, it, like the flow of samples is coming from, like for instance, Galaxy Zoo is coming from this service provider, and then you're just crowdsourcing um, uh, recognition tasks. But Mushroom Observer has this complex, interconnected community of you know experts and novices, and everybody's getting something out of it. Every act, every action that you can do on the site has some benefit to the factor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It seems like that's a really important. Yeah. Part of, like a, yeah, like yeah. So I, I completely agree. So I think it's nothing wrong if you like test Python. If you really like maybe at least learn how to do it. Like, you know, if you get skills as knowledge is not yeah. enough. If you, you like, if you make it really to, to get education and then you know, get abstract and I don't know, it's like it's fine line, but I'm like maybe like observe these things when it's time to Cool. Oh, um, if you're part of the Northwest and you're interested in mushroom hunting and don't know where to start, um, don't know where things mushrooms are, I would also encourage you not just using Mushroom Observer, but go to the Cascade Mycological Society Forum and see what they have to say. Because they, um, a lot of mycological societies are pretty closed, but they have an open available forum that you can go on and people are pretty open about general areas of where they're finding things. I, I find it really useful. Cool. All right. Thank you.